Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I will be uh, essentially following what I, uh, what Nick Soda um, presented just before lunch. Um, and so I want to start with just uh, thanking all of these um, collaborators. Uh, they are all uh, members of Nick's group at LBL. And they are the ones who, oh, except Hugo. <laughs> but Hugo also worked extensively with um, uh, this uh, GPU port. Uh, and therefore, um, I, uh, I think it's uh, only fair to acknowledge all the people who've done the actual work. Um, and so um, the things, uh, the, 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 the technique that uh, Nick uh, presented uh, just before lunch um, uh, is uh, this technique of crystallography. And just in, uh, in, in the most basic physical terms, um, imagine you have a crystal in, in the sense that it's a lattice of uh, scatterers. And what will happen is an, as an X-ray beam comes in, they will, uh, the X-rays, the coherent X-rays will scatter off these scatterers that are arranged in a, la a regular lattice. Some physics happens, and then on a detector, you will see bright peaks uh, with dark regions in between. And here's a sketch for a one-dimensional array of scatterers. You would see um, these um, uh, localized peaks and some, some maybe a little bit of in uh, structure in between. And in fact, we can we can be specific about what kind of physics happens there. Uh, it's all wave optics, really. So when uh, you can think of uh, each of these scatterers as sources of uh, coherent light, um, in this case, X-ray light, and depending on which position I choose, on uh, which pixel I choose on my detector here, I will either get destructive interference or I will get constructive interference at that position from all the from all the waves emanating from all the scatterers. Um, and, and this means that um, we can actually, because we understand wave physics very well, we can actually simulate um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the intensity that we would see at each one of these pixels. And that's given by this equation here. And the important thing about that equation is that it's a combination of uh, um, structure from in the, the individual uh, um, scatterers and uh, a combination of the arrangement of the different scatterers themselves, which lead to different intensities of this inter interference. And then we have some uh, properties of the incoming um, wavelengths as well. And on top of that, we'll see some random noise that, that will uh, um, be uh, interacting with the uh, individual pixels as well. So there's a kind of a background to all of this uh, that needs to be filtered out. And uh, essentially, uh, why are we interested in this sort of thing? Um, well, the, the previous slide uh, shows uh, what, what we sort of like the forward direction of this kind of simulation. Essentially, if we start off with a crystal and the parameters associated with a beam, we can produce interference patterns. But this is uh, the, the much more exciting problem is to flip it around. Um, so essentially, we could have a bunch of uh, diffraction patterns. These are real diffraction patterns. Um, and what we want to know is what are the crystals responsible for, for producing that kind of uh, uh, pattern? And in fact, we, we can't just like disentangle the crystals from, from the properties of the beam themselves. And so the, the vision of all of this is we will take um, a, a massive amount of these uh, uh, images and we will cram them all into pearl matter and out comes uh, some interesting signs, some, some unknown structures that, that we are interested in. And so the way we achieve this uh, using CCTBX is um, essentially a hierarchy of different codes. You can uh, take a look at CCTBX uh, here. Um, and essentially, the, the, the overall structure of these simulations is, is roughly the same. Um, on the top, on the user facing uh, level, we have um, a Python that sort of acts as, a, as the glue code that will uh, orchestrate the data analysis. And so you might have something like this. We'll loop over a bunch of parameters. We might want to, for each parameter, do some simulations and then some uh, 
data um, IO. And we don't really want to stay in, in Python altogether. We, we use um, uh, Boost uh, Python as an API to expose a C++ backend um, to Python. And this C++ backend, um, it, it orchestrates all the, um, the IO, the data structures, or the, the logic that you might need for uh, crystallography. And uh, in, as part of our port to GPUs, we have uh, started to take the most expensive components out of the C++ backend, and we've started writing CUDA implementations for these selected functions. Um, and, this, um, and this basically, uh, the, the, these sort of CUDA uh, implementations, they are um, fairly um, straightforward, actually, for, for the forward simulations of bright spots. Uh, and that's because our problem is uh, fairly easily paralyzed. The, the, the individual pixels um, don't interact with one another, not at, at least in, in the forward simulations. So what you can do is, um, while your original C++ loop might have looped over pixels, what we will do is we will assign um, each um, uh, CUDA thread a, a, um, a set of pixels and we will just iterate over them in a strided fashion. And then uh, for each pixel, independently of what the other pixels are doing, um, we're essentially evaluating this function here. And um, this has a bunch of different uh, loops as well. Um, and they, they all deal with a slightly different uh, physics. Um, so for instance, we, will, we might be wanting to resolve sub-pixel details. Um, the detectors themselves, they, they, there are some physics associated with um, how they absorb um, x-rays. And therefore, um, we can uh, loop over like detector thickness, essentially. The thicker, the more easily it absorbs uh, a, um, a photon. Uh, the photons can also come from different sources and can have different angles. And the, the crystal might also have not the perfectly regular structure, but there might be different mosaicity. And so we might need to um, uh, um, iterate over those domains. And so finally, once we have solved, once we have computed this on the uh, GPU, we haven't uh, ported the background, uh, the noise yet uh, to the uh, CPU. So uh, on the CPU, we will add this random noise. Um, and so let's just see what, what the end result uh, of, of such a NanoBrag simulation is. So NanoBrag, by the way, refers to this forward simulation. Uh, and so what uh, NanoBrag does is it will um, take some parameters, some details of the crystal that you're simulating uh, and the wavelengths and the, the beam, um, and it will produce Bragg spots. So um, there are several things I want uh, you to be aware of here. Uh, Bragg spots are fairly localized. Uh, Nick did show that they do have a structure. In this simulation, I've actually zoomed in here into the center. You can see they're sort of fuzzy blobs, essentially. So they, 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 are, they are not points uh, in the true mathematical sense. And you can see that they all have varying intensities. Um, and there is a background here. And um, now, now to, to get maybe a handle on the inverse problem, I thought it might be instructive to look at what happens when I uh, simulate uh, changing the, uh, the, the, the crystal position or uh, distance from this detector. So these are videos um, here, for example, for, for, for this video, what I'm doing is I'm actually moving the uh, crystal further away from the detector. And you can see that the, the spots are all moving outwards. You can also, you might be able to see some noise in here, that this is the simulated noise, and also some aliasing, because as, as I move, my interactions with the pixels uh, will be different. So I might see some aliasing effects. And this would be fairly simple to, to, to look at uh, a diffraction pattern. Uh, and then to, if you know what you're looking at, if you know what kind of crystal you're looking at, uh, then you can um, just look at the positions of the pixels themselves. And you can say, oh, well, it was at that distance from the detector. So let's look at the more complicated situation. Let's rotate the crystal about the c-axis. And we see something much more uh, you know, trippy happening here. So we're really only rotating the, the, the crystal. So 
uh, it's actually creating a, a completely different looking pattern. You might say, oh, there's still some symmetries in here. So from the symmetries, we might infer what's going on. But uh, remember, a computer isn't necessarily so uh, smart, right? So to say like, oh, look for a symmetry uh, might be harder. So from an um, inverse problem uh, perspective to say, oh, we have any snapshot in this video, what's the orientation of the crystal uh, might even be uh, already a harder ask. Um, anyway, so, um, so getting back to uh, the uh, GPU um, port um, of, of Nanobrag, um, you, uh, so uh, our, essentially our first objective, uh, and this has actually happened um, before I joined the project, was to accelerate these forward simulations, to, to start with some uh, known parameters and uh, simulate the Bragg spots, and to accelerate uh, that code. And so here you can see a um, comparison between um, the performance of CUDA on a V100 compared to a single thread on uh, Scalic CPU. And essentially, um, what, you, uh, what, what that work has done is it has condensed this, this darker blue block here down into these uh, cyan and uh, green and yellow stripes. So, um, uh, so as I said before, the uh, adding the noise uh, hasn't been uh, moved to CUDA yet. So that's why this, this block here, if you really cared about noise, and uh, this might be the next target. Um, however, let's ignore that for now. And you can see that we have uh, 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 accelerated the uh, spot simulation by a factor of 22. We could accelerate it uh, and probably will accelerate it much further because uh, data movement is currently taking up at, um, uh, about 51% of the CUDA uh, time. And also there, there's an API overhead that's pretty high. So we will be looking into that uh, more. And so the reason why we, we care about this is uh, something that uh, Nick alluded to before. Uh, and that is, we are interested in the inverse problem. We want to start with a lot of uh, simulated image. Well, we, what we want to do is we want to tell, based on uh, forward simulations like these, we want to tell what, is the, what are the crystal parameters of this measured image here. You can see some Bragg spots over here. Doesn't look like anything like that, but the idea is let's iterate over different forward simulations that minimizes the mismatch between the forward simulation and the measured data. In fact, um, we can do this intelligently uh, with uh, quasi-Newton optimization. And essentially the idea is we'll use a forward simulation uh, and the measured pixels to guide our next parameters for the forward simulations and to iteratively decrease the mismatch. And, and, and the lowest mismatching parameters, that will be our best estimate for the um, crystal parameters. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I also want to take maybe a minute or two just to point out that uh, with these kinds of codes, um, there, it's, it's, uh, there's an important aspect that sometimes is overlooked when we just want to accelerate kernels in that code. And that is the full software stack can matter. And this is just a, a small example of what happens when we uh, process a large batch of images uh, stored on disk. So here we have time on the X axis, and the MPI rank on the y-axis. And uh, red is bad here. Red means IO and data movement over the network. Um, and so the, uh, over here, we had a problem with MPI. So you can see things bunch up and there's a lot of red, so that's very bad. And then, we, um, and then over here, we've reduced this IO time by optimizing the, uh, the way we actually schedule uh, file access. But none of this is happening on the CUDA lab. Um, and so um, I want to plug, I, um, I just want to plug Jonathan Madston's uh, Timory uh, utility um, here because it allows us to build profilers that are able to profile across the Python, C++, and CUDA boundaries. And so just a very quick uh, basic example. In Python, we'll just import this object here, this wall clock object, and we can surround the Python constructor for our Nanobrag simulator. And then in C++, we can also use Timory to de decorate uh, the same uh, constructor actually, 
but here I've changed the label to C CPP versus pi, right? So I've sandwiched uh, the, the C profiler with the Python profiler. And now if we just profile this whole thing, you can see what's happening here. We're calling Nanobrag in Python that dispatches a call to C++. And the only thing that sits in between is the Python C++ API. And then when we look at the differences in the time taken, you can see uh, in this example, we can pick up on the uh, Python API call um, time spent. Um, and so um, this is uh, so. so um, I, I will be con will be essentially expanding the use of Timory to not only profile CUDA but but to um, essentially to get a snapshot of um, the full software stack. Johannes, uh, you have thirty seconds left. Can you oh, wind up? That's perfect. I am already done. I just wanted perfect. to say that all work is work in progress. Um, our uh, Nanobrag CUDA port has already resulted in a decent speed up, but um, if, we, if we improve our data movement and our API um, based on um, what we're observing, uh, we can definitely get way more out of that one. Um, next on our plate is uh, optimizing the diffbrag iteration itself. And then finally, uh, we want to look at OpenMP offloading, but um, for example, there are some little issues uh, associated with uh, the fact that Python and our software stack likes GCC, which has some problems uh, uh, playing nice with uh, OpenMP at the moment. Uh, all right, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, and yeah, I'd love to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, yeah, so can we have a couple of questions, I think? So the audience can ask questions in the Q&A box. So Johannes, do you have any plans of uh, using this code on, on a different system other than NVIDIA GPUs? Um, yeah, so that's why we're interested in the open MP offloading. Um, at some point, this will run on an Exascale machine. Um, uh, currently, we have a workaround uh, strategy that, that is based on using Clang and then just hoping that the rest of Python doesn't balk when, when you cross-link. Um, uh, but yeah, so currently we've only uh, used um, Summit and uh, Core GPU and we'll be using Perlmutter, but um, I'm going to uh, deploy some of this on uh, Tulip uh, and Iris next, um, once we get the OpenMP uh, issues uh, figured out. So are you confident you'll be able to replicate the performance on OpenMP, the one you got from CUDA? <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Uh, I'm, I'm confident in it that, that we'll get something to work. I don't know whether the, like I'll be happy with the performance. <laughs>